thank you all so much for for being here. I know that we are all in crazy different time zones, and and so I really appreciate everybody making the time uh, to be here with us. Uh, my name is Tishna Lodi. I am the director of panels uh, and workshops. I also have my uh, partner in crime, Violet, uh, here with us today. We're going to be talking about what it's like to film during a pandemic. Um, I will be moderating moderating this tonight because um, I my job on sets right now is uh, being COVID compliance officer for a TV show. So I have a lot of experience of what that looks like on a on a scale. And then all of you have um, also filmed during a pandemic. So uh, I'm going to just turn it over to you guys uh, to introduce yourselves, and then we'll get started. Claire, would you like to go first? Oh, okay. Uh, my name's Claire. Um, I'm an independent producer based in um, Bournemouth, UK. I teach film producing at the Arts University in Bournemouth, so I supervise students and also make my own films. Um, and this year we've we've taken advantage of uh, really playing with the Unreal Engine and moving into uh, virtual production, so having fun with that. Wonderful. Uh, and Andrew, would you like to go next? Ah uh, yes, uh, my name's Andrew Jacks. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I'm an independent independent filmmaker. Um, really, just uh, rolling off my second film, and uh, it's uh, it's not my full time profession, but it's a uh, full time passion, and um, uh, and kind of starting to feel like a full time job. So uh, yeah, we um, uh, that's uh, that's my lot. Great. Living the dream, Andrew. There we go. I like it. Yes. <laughs> Full time. Um, oh, okay. yeah. So, uh, we're, I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm Tori. Uh, from, uh, so, we're from um, Fizz and Ginger Films. We're um, independent filmmakers uh, based in London. Um, yes, that's basically it, really. Yeah. So, we, um, <laughs> we, we've uh, started doing short films and we've just made our fourth feature film, um, which is the one that's uh, at Boston as well. So, very exciting. The no one's seen yet as well, which is very exciting. Yes, very excited for that. Um, wonderful. Thank you guys uh, for your introductions. Um, so the first question that I have is sort of the big uh, broad view of what's been going on with the pandemic of in what big ways and sort of generalized ways has the pandemic affected uh, your guys' process and, and making films? Um, just how has it affected the filmmaking process for you? and anybody can chime in whenever. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess, I guess if, if we sort of kick off, I think um, at the beginning of last year, at the beginning of 2020, we had um, uh, a couple of films that were sort of in pre-production, getting close to going. Um, we were in the process of kind of getting finance together, um, you know, and it was sort of looking like, oh, okay, 2020 is going to gonna be a good year for us. We're going to get two feature films done. Um, and then uh, that didn't happen, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and so, uh, so for us, it just completely changed, like, the way we work because basically we had to kind of just sort of sit down and go right we've got a we've got to write something that we can make with literally just the two of us yeah so we, we we went quite extreme to be honest yeah. we were sort of at the beginning that's the thing because i know i know things are up and running now and things have sort of changed but we because we we still, we did ours um right at the beginning um when no one was allowed to do anything so, and we sort of experimented, started off quite small, you know, um, the idea of, well, I've always wanted to make a film on an iPhone. I know loads of people are now kind of moving there and Steven Soderbergh's doing things. And, um, you know, let's see how far we can push that and we'll have a gimbal. Um, and then we, and for a while, we've wanted to know how small we can get a crew as well. Um, because, you know, we just like, we've always, you know, worked with fairly small crews, but still, you know, dozens and dozens of people around the place. Um, and we thought, okay, well, how small can we make it? Obviously, we didn't imagine it was just the two of us. So, so we we did the entire feature film with just the two of us because we couldn't, no one could go anywhere. We weren't allowed to do anything. So, I, I, yeah, we 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 approached it from that side. Um, but I know things opened up. Obviously, later on, now, but... yeah, it's sort of it's much more doable and people. <laughs> it's slow with it. I mean, I have I have filmed little bits and bobs, sort of short films and things, and yeah, yeah it you've does done some slow things down hugely, as I'm sure yeah. everyone else will know about. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, definitely slowing things down. Andrew, what about you? How do, how has the pandemic affected your your process of of making films? Uh, well, it look at. 
It just uh, complicated things, really. I mean, look, it's, it's. I think you know, we're all in different parts of the world, and you know, it was, it's a little bit different here in Australia. They, we had a pretty severe lockdown very early on, and um, it kind of looked like we weren't going to be able to shoot and and at all. Um, and then it, it um, they, you know, they got on top of the numbers, and governments felt happy enough to to release the hounds, so to speak. So we. Um, we then here in Victoria, we shot uh, with this, we got up and running and we we, cause we had everyone sort of you know, lined up and we got up and running. And really we were, we fit into this little area between our first lockdown. And then of course there was another breakout and we had another lockdown and we, we literally shot, I think about, uh, I think a few days after we finished shooting, it was within a week, we had a, a very severe lockdown after that again. So, but you know, on set, it was a strange place. It was a strange place because um, we had um, we had all the COVID safe. You know, we had we were all going around sanitising and doing this, that, and the other. And look, that broke down at various times. And you know, but by and large, everyone was pretty respectful. And you know, it was just it was just a bit of a weird weird place. I mean, it's a it's a weird place all, all around. But um, I think one of the, mo the most interesting things was just the different headspace of all the different people. You know. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Claire, what about you? Well, initially it wasn't going to affect me that much because I had just uh, just shot a, a short film in Malta um, in March. And so I was in, I'm in post-production with that film and I'm finishing off post on a feature we, swap, we shot last year in um, Switzerland. So I thought, oh, it's going to be fine. I'll just continue with post. I have all the student films that I'm supervising at the university. So I, was full, I managed to get uh, 42 student films made um, during the, the first term this, this year, which was last uh, last. September, October, November, and I thought, oh, I don't really need that hassle. But we have been playing with um, the potentials of the Unreal Engine. So we've been looking at how we can bring the Unreal Engine into our film practice. We've been working with that for about two or three years, and now virtual production is really starting to take off as partially a response to the, the COVID requirements for film. So rather than taking people out onto locations, you film the locations and then effectively do real-time cinematography with, with the Unreal. So I wasn't really planning on making a film during the lockdown because I was in post, but someone asked a question and it really annoyed me. And usually when I get annoyed, I sort of tend to look at a, a way to turn that into something positive. And the question was, what do you miss about your life before? And I thought, what a bloody useless question that is. What's the point of missing what happened before? We're in this situation now. We can only look forward. Um, and Fiona, who's the director and my partner, had written a piece of music, which I use, I called The Vowels, uh, which is the, the music. And we decided we would do a virtual, a visual essay on nostalgia. And so that's where it came. So feeling, I'm also in the clinically vulnerable group, so I'm locked into my house. And I've been locked into my house for pretty much a year now, almost a year, coming up to a year in March. And so I, the, the possibilities of the Unreal Engine to open up an imaginary world, thought, right, let's do it. Let's make a short film because we didn't have the energy or the time to make a longer piece. So, um, so we did this essay on nostalgia, um, bringing together the VE Day was happening and the Queen was saying, oh, it's all going to be fabulous. We'll meet our family and friends again. And that just got us angry. And so we made a film. So um, it, I suppose the, the concentration of um, feeling and, and I think we're all independent filmmakers and I think we have that thing that something overwhelms us in terms of a feeling or a passion or a thought and we, as indie filmmakers, have it within our remit to just go out and fucking make a film. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to swear, am I? Um, go out and just make it. Just just do it. And so that's the, that's what I love about being an indie filmmaker. So, um, so it, in a funny way, it didn't affect my process in the sense that... Um, I was already in post on traditional films, but it did give me an opportunity to think think outside the um, outside the square. And so now we're accelerating the process of developing our first feature for uh, virtual production. We're not quite sure if it'll be fully animated or whether it'll be a, a mixture of um, live action and animation. That that's so. I think on the forefront of most people's minds, and and sort of to every you know to the point of. Um, you know, what, what Matt said, it's sort of like at the beginning, things were really tight knit. And then as things have progressed, you know, I'm, I'm on a big TV show with lots of people. And so they are allowing filming to happen on that big scale mm -hmm. again. But one of the things, and one of the conversations I think that came up, especially early on 
of the pandemic was how is this going to change the landscape of what we are actually seeing, what is actually mm -hmm. being made? How is it going to affect yeah. the kind of movies, the kinds of TV shows, and not just in its process of how it gets made, but the actual, how does that affect the content? Um, and, and Claire, you're talking a little bit about that of like, how has this you know, influence the things that you're making. Um, and I would love to hear from Andrew and, and Matt and Tori as well on if you've experienced that as well. Has it been affecting the content of what you are personally making or what you hear others might be making as well? Um, it, it, well, look, it, we were so far down the track with this project. It was either going to happen or it wasn't going to happen. So, um, so I, I think, um, you know, um, with the likes of Claire, who's involved in obviously many projects, that's something that's um, probably a little bit more uh, prevalent right here and now. But for someone like myself who makes one every so often, you know, so um, how how that'll happen for the next project, I don't know. But I I know on this project, we we really seriously had to consider just you know the the, the simple practical of, uh, um, ideas of. We have a number of scenes that are close, you know, where the, where the, the two the main protagonists are in close contact and there was, a, you know, some tussling and this, that and the other. And that was a that was a concern for us, you know, are we going to be able to do that safely and the like. And so, it, look, it got to the point where the, our two main protagonists had, had tests a week out and then isolated themselves and all that sort of stuff. So it was, um, we just had to kind of go through those those steps to 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 make everyone safe now gee is that going to is that going to continue i, I don't know i mean who knows what's what, i mean that everyone's going to be coming at it from different angles you know so I, I i think on a grand scale i think this is sort of sped up what felt like it was already happening in lots of places as well so you know all, it, the huge sort of knock-on effect with all the studios sort of deciding you know, huge things and um uh, so over, over here in the uk um, you know, the, the divide between sort of big budgets and small budgets um, is getting sort of further and further as well. And I, I think what I, what this, this is partly why we wanted to experiment and seeing how small we can um, uh, make a film that still, you know, can will, will be played you know, in cinemas and things like that as well. I mean, this is quite extreme, but I've been mean, speaking to other producers in the last sort of few months as well. More people sort of thinking, OK, so if it is possible to have a much smaller crew with all this lovely equipment and, and technology that we can use then and because budgets are sort of getting smaller you know that that i think it's sort of sped that process up if that makes sense you know we people are already thinking you know so a year ago okay we need 40 people now like well can we do it with six or seven and we've already there's people we know already who who kind of like saw that what you know we were doing with just sort of two people over in the summer going Okay, that's a bit, a bit mad, but um, you know, people are going. Well, I had an idea that I, I was trying to get money for I mean, for two years. Now I'm just going to go and do it. I'm going to get five five crew yeah. and a handful of actors, and but they're designing it around the situation. So they yeah. went, okay, so we can't travel around a lot. So let's have one location. Let's build the story around the situation. So and I think, so I think you know, that obviously you know things will open up again. But I think people are realizing. Yeah, I think there'll be more. Yeah, I think, be more yeah, I think that. that's um, I think yeah. that's interesting because a lot of the bigger budget budget films. Because I'm an indie producer, I'm, I've been doing micro budget films for for ten years now, and so what's been interesting is that the bigger studios are learning from the independent sector because they're not taking as many people on set as they used to. So the only issue for me is I can't multi skill my crew as I used to because I used to run with a routine crew of between um, twelve and fifteen people, and people would take. Uh, would share responsibilities but now with with distancing i am looking at different ways of managing crews um, on set um, but the the thing that i like about being able to play with with unreal for instance is i don't have to be stuck within four walls because i've been living within four walls for a year so when i make films now i want to imagine what's outside those four walls and use the the technology which is which is really exciting because that's also accelerating is working out how much do we have to shoot actually live how can we be really creative in how we use um, the, the skills we have? And a lot of that energy is being driven by lower budget people because we don't have the money. We have to think creative, creatively. So it is really, and, and what has been so great is with audiences, the hunger that they have because the big films aren't being released and they're not being made, the hunger they have for content and, the, and very simple ideas that are executed well are finally hitting the market. Whereas in the past they would just languish people are finally being able to see the films that, that we've been working on for years, all of us in, in various ways, telling good human stories that 
the audience want, but they've been blocked from getting them because of the, the platforms and the, um, the cinemas holding us out. Yeah, and, yeah. and distributors are, are actively looking for projects. So they're going to all the indie people going, actually, have you got films? And we're like, yes, we've got lots. Of course we've got films, um, which, is, which is great. Yeah, and the cinemas as well. So, I mean, well, if they open back up over here again, you know, they're going to take on Infinitum, which was shot on an iPhone. You know, we've got various cinemas around the country wanting to show it. I mean, you know, there's no way a year ago, realistically, I think that would have happened. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think on a, on a sort, of, um, sort of subject um mm. level i think we quite interestingly we were we were watching a, a tv series um called cobra which is a was a british series that um sky produced last year so it was released at the beginning i think of last year the beginning of 2020 and um i think if it had come out a couple of years ago maybe people would have been a bit like this is kind of extreme but because of what's happened and what we've all gone through like we watched it and we were like yeah, yeah like, it okay, could happen it's sort of every yeah. 10 minutes like <laughs> okay there's a solar storm and now there's a riot and then there's this and like that's it's not like, realistic and now it's, it's, really, oh. it's really intense yeah. it's like every episode like yeah, something I else disastrous yeah. happens you can always time it two minutes time there's going to be an explosion yes yeah. there we go <laughs> it's the british government dealing with which is not you know not but, usually you know, very british and but. i sort of wonder whether actually um that will have us there'll be a knock on effect of um the <laughs> well, kind yeah, of content that we're going to see um and the subject matters that we're going to see and whether actually like stuff will be pushed that little bit further because I think perhaps now we're all kind of more open <laughs> to the possibility yeah. of the extreme actually being well, reality. And also, which, last time the world had a pandemic, you know, the Spanish, you know, the Spanish one in 19, 18 to 20, and then we had the Roaring Twenties, everyone went crazy and then we had amazing literature and yeah. poet, um, in plays and things. Maybe we'll have this explosion of really interesting art and yeah films, exactly yeah. yes and and that's something that um you know what we've noticed uh just trying to create our festival and how can we bring it to people in a virtual space we almost had overwhelming options and didn't know mm. like where we could go because just the options of uh, of getting our festival to people expanded so much from it being on the virtual space that we did see that a lot of films that we wanted to um that approached us uh backed out because they got distribution all of a sudden you know which is a wonderful thing that's what we want that's why we want people to come to our festival to be seen and they're having yeah. the opportunity to be seen um and get distribution much sooner than they would have you know usually they they come to our festival in hopes of that and and now they have to to change their plans because they're getting it. And um, it's started the conversation for us on, on the festival end um, of exactly that of, of, you know, streaming was already changing the landscape of how you received your, your content. And this mm. definitely sort of exasperated that and making that go faster mm. and, and getting access to things that maybe you didn't get access to before. For instance, one of the categories is now shorts on my Netflix, which is wonderful. That was never a thing that I had easy access oh. to unless I looked for it specifically. Um, what it, Tori sort of, sort of started talking about uh, this with, you know, you're looking at extreme circumstance in your everyday life and now what you can consume as, in, in fiction uh, sort of expanded of what you're, <laughs> you'll believe as real. Um, <laughs> your suspension of disbelief has sort of expanded. <laughs> um, and as a sci-fi festival, as a genre festival, we're curious as to what you guys think might um, sort of come from that. Will genre and sci-fi have always sort of pushed the boundaries of that extreme and, and what can you see? And just curious what you guys think might continue to grow from that, whether it be actual things you've seen that might start popping up in sci-fi movies or um, maybe films that have already been made that might get rebooted because of what's happened. What, what do you guys think? That's a tough question. I acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've always, um, I always, the, the film that got me started um, it, when I was uh, seven, I was growing up in the Pacific Islands. Uh, we had scratchy pirate TV and my mother called me to watch uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey on a little 12 inch black and white TV. And my world was just rocked by it. Um, a few months later, I went back to New Zealand and I saw it um, on a what would now probably be about a 56 inch screen and and it was just magic. And so the thing that always that 
the reason why I wanted to be involved in making film, and it was a long journey to get to be a filmmaker, but I, I, I'm like you, Andrew, I tried to get there, but it was tough. And so it was a later life career change, uh, was always that ability to create magic. And and the, the magic of, of film, the, to open up horizons and to show realities that could be or haven't yet been or could have been, and to create magical worlds that, that uh, just break us out of the everyday. And like I said, being locked in my house in the four walls for a year has really wanted me to see places where I could go or I could be. Um, and the power of film to do that. And the imagination that we have in, in there's so much more imagination in any scripts than there are in, in the really processed scripts. So I like seeing the roughness and the rawness and the, just the raw passion and magic from the indie world in terms of sci-fi, in terms of fantasy, uh, in terms of do we have to have post-apocalyptic now? I think we're now in the apocalyptic genre rather than... Um... <laughs> so for me, it's really about opening up the magical spaces and to, to provide that, that sense of optimism and hope uh, that, that sci-fi films almost always end with. We might go through a horrible journey, but we always end up in a good place at the end, mostly. Mm. Did, you, did you end up in a good place at the end, Fizz and Ginger? Don't spoil it, but did you? <laughs> Oh, the film. Well, it's 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 sort of a continuation. I think mean, we couldn't quite. You know, they just went okay. There's potential. There's hope, of course, but also there's continuation because, especially where, when we were filming it, it was very much slap bang in the middle of uh, 2020. So yeah, <laughs> but that's it's exactly right though. This you know this this genre uh, you know this, this this sort of world of sci-fi. It's, it's always been about you know it's it's the it's the, like the perfect sort of hero's journey and all that sort of stuff, isn't it? Of you know the journey of the ups and downs and then hope at the end. You know it's it's perfect for it. So I think. Yeah, I think we probably will see sort of and explosion escapism. and escapism. But yeah, yeah, perhaps more, perhaps more fantasy stuff. Um, uh, I'm I'm always like a massive fan of. I've done some cre creature work as well, and I I mean I love all that and like full prosthetics and the challenge of that. So um, you know maybe maybe more of that kind of stuff, like yeah. pure fantasy, pure escapism. But yeah, may maybe it'll start, maybe some sort of darker ideas will come out of it, but with that. You know, that end hope, that would be nice. That would be nice to see. Andrew, what do you think? Oh, I mean, I, f I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I kind of imagine that um, in the short term, we're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot more sort of smaller stories, you know. I mean, um, uh, mm. talk about the post-apocalyptic or apocalyptic um, uh, stories. Uh, um, I don't know. I think... Um, uh, a lot of people are, are really exploring and people are living in different spaces now. It's not, I mean, so I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. I mean, what's going to happen to cinema? You know, I mean, we were talking, talking earlier about um, uh, you know, how Netflix and the like were changing the landscape already. Um, you, you've got this thrown in into the mix and then there's you know, people's headspace about sitting in, in cinemas and the like. And then on top of that, we um, have you know, a lot of the studios and the bigger productions now deciding to put stuff online and, and the like. So um, where it all, it's all going, I've got no idea really. Um, but um, I think, you know, people are, people are still going to want to watch stuff. People are still going to want to make, we're still going to want to make things. So I think um, there's, a, there's a mix of, you know, whatever's going on in people's lives and and um, and whatever's possible going forward as well. I mean, that's um, it's going to be it's going to be fun to see where where it all goes. I don't I don't think we'll get anything different than we already have. We get the good mix of you know the the heartfelt stories and and you know and uh, all the stuff that that brings you down, which is kind of really nice to watch too. But you know, well, one of the things that opened up for me out of um, out of making a film in Unreal was the possibility of of a, and Unreal is is a fantastic platform in a way because it creates the possibility of um, us independent filmmakers being able to start to leverage immersive environments and virtual reality. So one of the things that we're looking at doing with the film that we made is creating a virtual landscape because the film's got a virtual landscape. We created a virtual landscape and then we shot the film in the virtual landscape. So what we're looking at is how we can turn that into an experience that people can come into. And this is something that doesn't have to be left to the, to the big budget uh, studios or the broadcasters to manage. The technology is becoming more and more accessible for us as filmmakers to take out our, our stories and to be able to transform them into different ways of experiencing. I mean, I'm, I'm hanging out to go back to the cinema. I don't really like a lot of the virtual reality games, but when I went into our virtual landscape with a headset on, it just I felt transported. So I want to be able to share that. And these are 
these are things that this particular moment in time might be making more accessible, making audience more ready to have different experiences if they can't go to cinema? Are they more interested in having immersive um, experiences with or without headsets? So there are technologies that are starting to, to ramp up because of the constraints that COVID is giving us. Uh, with the virtual production, when you see the real-time cinematography with the landscape being projected on an LED screen behind the actors, it's only a step ahead of that to turn that into a landscape that you can come into as the actor. Um, it's, it's not too far away from us being able to start to play with those types of ideas. And I think it's the sci-fi and fantasy filmmakers who'll be leading that push. And I think the audience need us to lead that push, not necessarily the, um, the big studios with the, the very polished scripts that they have, because it's that energy that, that, uh, that we bring. That's um, incredibly fascinating and something that I actually never um, really thought of. I thought of the technologies that will expand because of COVID of, um, you know, per, how do we sort of problem solve some of these things of like going on location, things like that. And we've heard of some productions using, you know, instead of going to location, they have the sort of big screens, the LED screens that you film in and it, it replicates the location instead of going there, um, as well as some other, you know, techniques of, of manipulating um, actors' faces and, and how are all of those technologies gonna change? And I think uh, bringing up the immersive experiences um, something I didn't necessarily think of before about the virtual space and, and actual like virtual reality and how will that change? And that's a really, that's very fascinating. I didn't think about that. Um, well, a lot of, a lot of, um, I mean, I've, I've got children and you know, they, they spend a lot of time on, um, on various devices, but you know, gaming, I've noticed my, my daughter, my daughter's getting into gaming as well over the, over this, this, this year. So, um, you know, gaming's a, a whole different, you know, obviously it's a whole different space, but um, it, it, the amount, you know, like I say, say to my son, do you want to come and sit down and watch a movie? Yeah, not really. He's happy there just playing his game. So, you know, all, all of that sort of side of things and the, the way that um, the changing um, uh, content that the, the that kids these days are wanting to um, uh, ingest or, or, or take up is changing. And, and then I think also on top of that, you know, what's been going on this year, it's been very hard to kind of get them off their devices because what are you going to say, go outside and go and visit your friends and the like. So, um, yeah, the, I think uh, that'll, that's an interesting space as well with where, how that's going to, inf what, what the younger generation are going to be wanting to um see and partake in and, and, and watch as well yeah, yeah we said it's a, it's a great way of experiencing other worlds especially you know gaming you know games but we're in in vr you're you're actually you're, you're storytelling you know you're kind of in the middle of story but you're you're actually in the middle of it yourself mm. and you can control it and you're properly immersed in it yeah i think yeah it's exciting we've noticed that with the teenage boy that lives um opposite us and his light his bedroom light <laughs> is on to the wee small hours and you can see him in front of his like massive computer screens and he's yeah. like well, gaming yeah. away doing like all Still, of this yeah but communicating with all his friends around the world and things yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> well, actually, we, we know someone who actually um so during the he was doing commercials and things but he was actually um in other parts of the world where, where it was a little bit you know not as dodgy as the uk so he was directing over zoom and, and all sorts of oh, things yeah, so they yeah. you know, they had you know, they had producers in la director was in the UK and his crew were in Romania and things and being able to kind of, you know, even make things whilst people in different parts of the world is, you know, it's extraordinary as well. I don't think, you know, people, they would have just spent a fortune flying him out and now people are going, well, hang on, you can do that. Stick him you on a screen. Stick him on the screen and we can save a lot of money. I think, you know, even small <laughs> things like that, I think are going to affect how things are done. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that actually sort of brings me to my next question of sort of um, how is this going to, you know, We've talked about content. We've talked about maybe the possibility of experiences. Do how do we think this might affect set experience and set life for a long term? I remember seeing um, there was an article that came out um, after uh, that I read after studio studios started opening up, and one of the restrictions is that uh, at least that I've experienced, a lot of uh, people are adopting French hours uh, and working through lunch and only filming for 10 hours a day when typically here in America, it's 12 hours a day. Um, and so 
some of that is changing in terms of like the culture and what's expected because trying to limit hours that you're around other people. But one of the article that I read was uh, addressing how maybe that can continue on even after the pandemic because it's creating a better space this mm. on set and a better uh, culture on set. People are working less. Um, they have a little bit more life, uh, life work balance. Um, are there things on your guys' uh, sets and when you were making your films that you thought that were different than what you normally may have done that you really enjoyed, that you wish, that you hope to bring with you even post pandemic um, that you think should stay and, and maybe some things that you, you don't want to stay, like the constant sanitizing? Uh <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't. One of the things, I, I did actually produce a feature film um, during the, the lockdown, but I did it remotely, very, very remotely. So I delegated down to my line producer, production manager, but we, the crew on set was, and it wasn't sci-fi, so that's why it's not, not really been talking about it. Um, but we did have, we did have this um, experience that we often get people who are getting colds on set because the hours are long and people are working and they're tired. And once someone gets a cold, it just goes right around the, right around the whole crew. And one of the things that we've started to notice is that the general level of health on sets is increasing uh, while we're, we're shooting because people are taking a lot more care with their health. They're washing their hands, they're wearing their masks, they're being they're being careful. And as much as we love hugging and kissing um, on sets, and that's gone, um, that I hope will come back because film is very much a people engaging uh, uh, environment. And I, I, I was working on some COVID training over the weekend with the Production Guild in the UK. And one of the comments that was made was understanding how many, how much of a first AD's job is a very tactile job to be in contact with cast, to help cast feel reassured, to help crew feel, feel reassured. And what was one of the things that they were observing that the COVID protocols were, were doing was that people weren't touching each other anymore. And it was creating a sense of emotional distance on the set, um, which we miss um, having that emotional closeness on the set, that sense of being a family together, making something creative. So I hope we can get rid of that. But I don't mind people looking after each other's health, like you're saying, managing a work-life balance, making sure people are getting fresh air breaks every hour, making sure that there's good circulation going through. There's a lot of good stuff that we've been dealing with for a long time. We've been neglecting people's health. So the fact that health is now, and also mental health, has been has come to the forefront as well, particularly in the UK, because it is an issue in the film industry. We've been worried about people working very long hours. We've been working worrying about people maintaining family relationships all of these these um, aspects which are now fair to talk about. In the past you were considered somewhat weak or moaning if you were talking about um, what was expected and on my sets we never work more than 12 hours a day uh, and we lock it out at 12 hours but I know in TV people can be walking, working 16 or 17 hours and then expected to turn up eight hours later and they love the overtime but what does it do to their families? So there are there are things that have allowed us to reopen the dialogue about the way that we work in this industry and the occupational health of people working in the industry. So I want to keep that. That I'd like to keep. Hugging, can we bring yeah. that back? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Matt, Tori, what do, you, what do you think? Well, I mean, because our experience, uh, w it was quite literally us two. So well, well, um, we had, well, well, I was thinking that because we, we had crew watching, you know, so people were re reviewing footage. So all our crew, so we had you know, editors watching VFX people to reviewing footage and things like that, which I, which was quite nice as well to be able to kind of get ahead of things. So from that point of view, we, we had to be a lot more diligent. So it, because it was just the two of us, um, you know, so, um, so the grader who's using my DOP was sort of seeing things and he go, okay, so no, no, this is how you need to like this, that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, and actually, I mean, Ed, uh, Will was kind of editing almost as we were going along. Which we'd never done before. I know people do have, uh, you know, on-set yeah. editors and things, but... And Will has been on-set with us before, but, mm. but because, I guess, because he was sitting at home in lockdown going, well, I might as well just start, you know? <laughs> so, so it meant that actually, I think it, it sort of... We, it, and any sort of problems we saw way quicker. before they were going to really sort of trip us up, which was really yeah. nice. Um, I think also having a really tiny crew, we could sort of, um, you know, if, if we went, oh, this doesn't work, let's just go back and do it again. That's, that was really nice. Rather than having to worry about 40 people going, guys, we've got to go back. What we did yesterday it didn't quite work. Um, so that was that, that would be quite nice to keep, be able to kind of, you know, more flexible sort of time. But also, yeah, like we, some, sometimes we go, well, we've, we've done six hours and, 
Oh, I'm sort of not feeling it now. Let's let's stop. That was great. Yeah. So I mean, if we can have maybe maybe not that extreme, yeah, but you know, the the more flexible sort of hour, you know, the shorter hours and and things, um, I think would be very nice to keep. From an acting point of view, it was it was mm. nice to not have the time constraints and be like, oh, can we just do that again? Um, and and you know, be able to feel like you can ask that and not hold up like forty people. Um, yeah, exactly. I'd actually like to. I mean, most people kind of want to have bigger budgets and more people, I want to go start going the other way yeah. and going, hang on, this, I mean, more than just us, but still a handful of people. I just love to, to do that for mm. a while. I mean, I have um, to yeah, keep say, it real. Yeah, yeah, I did really miss having a first. I really missed having a makeup artist. I really missed... This is not what we're talking about. <laughs> having production design. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I liked it. I thought a it was gaffer great. would have been really great. A sound person would have been yeah. lovely. Yeah, so you're, you're back up to the type of crew that I'm used to, which is about the 12 to 15 people. Exactly. And, and that, that to me seems to be a bit of a sweet spot for, for a crew to keep it, keep it real, to keep the people that we need, everyone's engaged. Uh, we don't get things getting lost in the wash. But no, it is... Um, it, uh, because I, I, I suppose it's not um, being too impersonal to say I, I presumed you were working in a close contact bubble, so um, so you had a, had that 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 sort of freedom to not have to worry about all of the the extra concerns about exactly about. exactly yeah yeah and then on, on our, on one of our big main locations was this huge Jacobean mansion with a hundred rooms, but it was just us, so we could also there was no you know <laughs> we could just potter around do whatever we wanted, and as yeah. long as we let them know where we're going and they'd clean it afterwards and that sort of stuff. So a lot of the things that people had to worry about, we didn't, to be perfectly honest, um, which and was great. It was the quietest rap party. Ever, yes, I think a cup of tea and a crumpet. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the whole, yeah, on the like hugs and the and the yeah, bringing hugging back, yeah, and just well done, having, well, well having done. people. <laughs> Although, actually, it was my 40th birthday about two days after, so we had, yeah, we had a true. couple of people in the garden, so that was quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, how about you? You had a, a, what from what it sounds like, you had some more people, actors to work with. Uh, how was that? How was that experience for you? And, and yeah, well, what would you like to keep or get rid of? <laughs> well, I mean, our shoot was um, pretty traditional in, in that sense. I mean, the, the only diff I mean, we had that sort of uh, 15 sort of, I think thereabouts, you know, the sort of standard sort of basic sort of low budget sort of, you know, um, crew that you would traditionally see. Um, and, you know, it, it, it operated as as expected, you know, so, but the the, Pretty much, if we can just get rid of all the all the the, the COVID sort of um, uh, protocols, that would be just awesome. Because it's it's um, I I think I mentioned this earlier. The one of the hardest things was that was just dealing with everyone's different headspace when you've got a bunch of different people. Because um, you know, I, I, I in my my day job, I I was. Um, in a what was considered an essential service, so my, I was going to work, you know, right through the, the whole the whole thing, um, and st and still are. But you know, I, uh, we were I was dealing with various people on set who were, um, you know, like Claire, who were basically sort of um, in their apartments most of the time because they either weren't didn't have work or weren't in a profession that um, that allowed them to go to work. And so they, some of them were coming on set for the first time. That was like their first sort of journey out of out. out. And so they were very cautious. And so it was, it was, um, mm. it was, uh, it was just interesting, sort of managing where everyone was at, because you know there were a number of people who had, you know, like myself, who were a little bit more, um, I won't say gung ho, but a little bit more relaxed with the whole thing. Um, um, yeah, and standing next to people who were kind of really quite nervous about it all. So. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was probably the, and that, and that relaxed and worked itself out over time. We all sort of figured out where we're all at. Um, but that was a little bit awkward and a little bit difficult to deal with up front, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, sort of to Tori and Matt's, you know, the rap party was, uh, your, your rap party was, was small. Um, I, I had wrapped a, a film at the end of, uh, December or right before the holidays. And one of the things that we all felt, you know, we, it was a smaller crew because of, of COVID and we, everything was in one location. So we all got to know each other extremely well uh, as you do on any set, but you know, when you go to the same spot, you don't have to 
figure anything out. Um, everybody sort of really created a, a, a culture there because it almost felt like going to an office every day, the same place every day. Um, one of the things that was kind of weird is on our last day, it, it was done and we made the announcement of that's a wrap on, on our film. And then we all just went home. That, that was it. There was sort of an anticlimactic feeling to it. And that was when we really, I think everybody had been operating pretty much as they do on any set, obviously with the COVID rules and that made things, certain things a little bit more frustrating to deal with, you know, camera crew having to stand six feet apart. And it's like, well, how am I supposed to do that? I'm supposed to hold the camera next to that person. Um, that was really the the moment when we really realized, well, I guess that's done. And then you move on. And so that feeling, I, I hope, is gone away. forever after <laughs> this. We can all uh, you know, to Claire's point, hug again and <laughs> and say our goodbyes and and that uh, family feel of a of a set. I hope uh, definitely comes back. It's still there, but being able mm. to really act on it. Um, yeah, well, we we still haven't had a um, a, a wrap party because, like I said, within yep. a few days, the lockdown, a really quite a severe lockdown, came here in Victoria. And so, and now we've still got number, because of the size of the crew, we've still got number of restrictions, so can't kind of have them all back. So we're just waiting for numbers to, you know, or things to change a little bit so we can, you know, by that stage, it'll be a combined rap party and a screening, I think. So, <laughs> and that was, that was an interesting um, process too, the, um, all the post work, you know, so doing a lot of post work. Um, so this, I, I quite, I, I quite enjoyed. I mean, for a little while, I sat in with uh, my editor and, and a couple of other, but, uh, the, um, but then we discovered that we weren't, weren't supposed to or weren't allowed to do that. So then doing, um, uh, sitting in editing session, sessions remotely with, you know, share, sh uh, screen sharing and all that sort of stuff was, was uh, 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 interesting and didn't feel overly different to, to sitting in the, in the same room. So it was... It, you know, it really, I think, opened up my editor's eyes as to what, I mean, he does a lot of work remotely anyway, but he's just pretty much doing everything remotely. And, and that has its positives and, of course, its negatives. I mean, because, I mean, we all like that. We we're just talking about that human contact. But, mm. yeah, it's like, it's like this, you know, I mean, this, this part of the festival scene is, on the one hand, fantastic because, you know, you get into a festival that, you can't go and visit and quite often, you know, you just, I did my film show, what was the reaction? You get so quite often, you know, because festivals are busy, busy places, you don't expect mm. to get all of that. But um, but being involved in a festival that you can't get to, you know, has complete, is, is completely changing. Now, yeah. personally, I, you know, I mean, I of course want to get back to the stage where I can go and visit a festival because that's where you really make those connections and, and you know, get to see all the other films and, you know, the whole, the family thing that we're talking about, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. And and what one of the benefits of this from the festival perspective is I get to have a panel with you guys all over the world. And, <laughs> you know, and I would not have been able to do that before. And uh, so that there are definitely uh, amongst all of this chaos, there is some, some positives. Um, so I, I want to, uh, come back to you guys and your content and the things that you make. Uh, Tori and Matt have talked about how they would love to do more low budget stuff. Uh, Claire's talked more about, you know, the virtual reality sort of aspect that she's, she's been exposed to. What do you have projects in mind now that you never thought of making before uh, COVID because of these new experiences? If so, so what are, I, I don't want you to, you know, blow the blow the secret and tell us everything that you're planning but i'd love to hear sort of how this has really influenced uh your art we've talked about content in general i'd love to know from from you guys specifically uh, well I'll, I'll go first um no changes <laughs> i i look uh, not not as yet not as yet i mean look this you know, this year has been a big year for me. Making a film for me is a is a big deal. It's not something that that happens all the time. Um, so you know, I've got I've got a, a number of uh, sort of projects in the wings, and we'll see which one pops its head up first. Um, 
Will that be influenced by what's going on? Possibly, I don't, I don't know. You kind of never know which project's going to going to sort of step, uh, put its foot forward. Um, so at, at this stage, no, no, it hasn't. I mean, it, it probably it might influence the way those projects flow and and the, the some of the ideas behind them. But you know, I think um, I think. Everyone's mind works in a different way, and you know the, the ideas that pop into your head are the uh, uh, you know they they come there from whatever whatever angle they get there from. So yeah, not at this stage, no, for me. I mean, for for us, I mean, for well, for me specifically, I I mean, it's changed hugely what um, I, I want to to do, and um, and well, and that's the way I'm sort of writing as well. But actually, the US distributor for Infinitum, because they really love the world. There's actually so this one, so it's Infinitum, subject unknown. The original, the big big one is Infinitum. So that was a huge, well, much bigger budgety sort of script that we wrote years ago. So this was sort of an offshoot of that, and um, and it, because it's parallel worlds and experiments and time travel and all sorts of things, it's sort of it, it leaves us open to lots of different chapters. And so the U.S. distributors already said that they want to they want more of them, um, and I, so I'm I'm definitely wandering off that way. We but at the at the beginning of the of last year, um, when we had the idea to create the spin off um, with just us two, we also um, commissioned an artist friend of mine to draw the graphic novel of the original full um, full screenplay, um, which is like the you know, three million dollar <laughs> one, um, and so and so the graphic novels kind of almost coming to completion. So um, whether we kind of use that and do some more kind of offshoots using that, um, but it, it's a sort of much bigger world that we can kind of um, keep looking into and but investigating. We're, but we're both writing things that at the moment are specifically so. A couple of locations, very small cast, and um, something you know. Yeah. So we, you know, we're trying to find a location and go right, right around that, so we know it's safe. We know we can get there, all that sort of Which stuff. So it's effect- kind of, to be honest, is always how we've worked before, anyway. Yeah, but, it's more um, but I think we're just sort of focusing on keeping the cast much smaller. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and even fewer locations than before. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, having said that and exactly, um, what you've just said, like, like you, you never know which one's going to go next. And, and actually because the, because the, vaccinations are coming through and, 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 um, you know, and it's actually becoming sort of much easier to, to have more people on set and hopefully actually in kind of six months or nine months time or maybe a year um when we've all got you know budgets together and stuff then mm. actually maybe it will be it end up being one of the projects that we were working on before yeah i still want to do small things I but, yeah, we can talk about it later <laughs> it's fine now i basically want to we've we've got a drag um a like a, a drag queen, drag queen heist, heist sort of thing film which is what we that i really to want to make because i think it'll yeah. be really fun but uh, <laughs> very different vibe very different vibe yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, I have, I have a, I have quite a few projects in in various stages of development. I've got the two that I'm finishing. But the thing that excited me with um, Rianne, with that, with our short, the audience feedback that we've had from screening it around different places. Uh, it's been in festivals in in the UK and in Spain and um, Canada, LA, Mexico, other places around, and we've had really been surprised by the level of acceptance that we've had. So it's really. Um, galvanized us to think about how we can really exploit this process that we've been working on of integrating these environments and working with with unreal because with with the technology that's coming where ray tracing is about six months away so being able to get photo real uh, and our film when you see it uh, if you want to see it uh, is is almost photo real it's clearly an animation because you don't just have people walking down the street with TVs on their heads but um, but it is um, it is, well, maybe you do, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it is one of those things where we can get those those photoreal effects that we want, avoiding the uncanny valley problem because I'm, I'm still working with live action film, but I love the potential of creating magical landscapes and creating stories and the audience ability to 
to move into that much more photorealistic animation style, particularly, I suppose, influenced by the uptake of gaming, is helping us to really explore some of the films. So one of the projects that we had was a series that was, it was funnily enough, kind of predicting this pandemic, which we started writing about um, about two years ago, but we didn't think we'd be able to get money for it, and we didn't think we'd be able to get it made. But now that we've made Rien, and it was just two of us making this, this film, uh, and we made it within 36 hours, um, so a three minute animated short within 36 hours, we now have the possibility of being able to take our content and, 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 and like Tori and Matt, being able to do working in, a, in, in close proximity with someone, you live with them, I presume, um, so you, you're almost always eating, chewing, discussing your projects, uh, it's the same, same in our house. And so we move, um, we now have the power much more clearly with not being the only thing we've already spent the budget on the computers so the computers we have we don't have to raise that much additional money to make these films happen it's now just unleashing imagination and and being able to to realize that imagination so the uptake of um, the animated style has opened up a whole range of, of prospects that we thought we would have to raise lots of money for and that we would be on this treadmill waiting to get to them we now can take control over those projects ourselves uh, for those those projects, there still are projects we need to do that do fit within traditional filmmaking um, budgets and, and distribution models. But we ha we are excited about the possibilities that are arising. So we're going to be doing some experimentation, probably doing a few more short films to try different aspects of the the process out before we launch into the into the feature production, which I want to be um, working on by September. Uh, the script's done, script's all done, but now we don't have to go, and it was budgeted around about 750000 to to a million. For a, it's a diesel punk neo-noir. Um, so it's very genre, very genre, 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 genre. And what do you, what's even better, it's an LGBT diesel punk neo-noir. So it's, it's, it's there, and we've been working on it for a while. It's a really cool story. Um, we've got our female Humphrey Bogart. She is sexy as, uh, so we can... Um, so we can we can we can now make it. We don't have to wait. Uh, we we and that's what I'm hoping that we can we can do. So it's diversifying, I suppose, and and being liberated. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it does, doesn't it? I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, we are uh, sort of uh, we're at the end of our time, and I wanted. Um, to just thank you guys for your questions and your questions, your answers and being here. And um, I am incredibly grateful and humbled to have been able to talk to you guys in your process of, of being on uh, sets and producing films during a pandemic. It's, it's certainly been tough um, and it certainly changed the landscape as our conversation has pointed to, but I, I have a lot of um, comfort in knowing that there are filmmakers like you guys who are up to the task and up to the challenge to make it uh, to make it something really beautiful and wonderful. And as uh, Matt sort of mentioned the last time we had something like this, we had a huge renaissance of art. And I certainly hope that that comes from from all of the struggle that we've we've seen in the last year. Um, so I just want to thank you again for being here and um, your time. Well, thank you, thank you for uh, bringing us to Boston because there was no other way we could have yeah. come to Boston. So I really so want to go to Boston as well. I wish I it was close enough for now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we should all have um, when it, when the borders are open up. We should have a retrospective for the the 2021 version uh, edition, and we'll all come. We'll all come and we'll all have a hug and a drink. Yeah. <laughs> That would, be, that would be lovely. I, I certainly will look forward to that moment when that that, that can happen. So um, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> um, we're so grateful to have you guys here. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your morning or, or night. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Thanks for having us.